How am I going to go about this challenging task of saying something meaningful at a distinguished place like this on something as basic as those two notions of power and justice, the interaction between the two of them, and the presumed tension between these two concepts, that to do this right, one had to really, since this is going to be an academic institution, to really actually do a little bit of research, go back and, and read and, and see if you cannot come up with a story about the progression of those ideas over time. What is really absolutely remarkable, having done so, was the conclusion that how little things have changed over that fairly long period of time in the life of a man. But as a matter of fact, if you really go back to before 40 years ago and objectively look at the genesis of human thinking and evolution of human thinking on those basic concepts that very much relate to our notion, understanding of the so-called human nature, the content of it, you will find that very little, at least that's my own conclusion with modesty, I tell you, very little has changed for thousands of years. Coming from the region I come from, uh, I thought it uh, significant to try to relate those concepts and ideas in the way they evolve over a period of time to contemporary issues in the region, and certainly closer to home, our own issue, Palestinian question. Exactly 42 years ago this year, right here in the Netherlands, two of the most world-renowned contemporary philosophers, Noam Chomsky and Michel Foucault, participated in a debate on the eternally mystifying question of human nature. The central question of the debate was whether there is such a thing as innate human nature, independent of our experiences and external influences. In other words, do we all have something that binds us together as human beings in spite of our differences? But I found this debate to be particularly fascinating what begins as a provocative philosophical argument evolves into a broader discussion encompassing a wide range of issues, including one that is the topic of today's lecture, the struggle for justice in the realm of political power. That is why we're here today, to explore the relationship between power and justice and to try to answer the age-old question how can these two notions be reconciled? Conceptually speaking, we all know that justice without power tends to be inefficient, and that power without justice, on the other hand, results in absolutism. But what does this mean? What does it mean practically? What does it mean pragmatically in a world where power plays a pivotal role in the attainment of justice? We'll start with this question and work our way backwards to the core idea of where our notion of justice comes from. Do we, as human beings, have an innate notion of justice? Or is this notion of justice that we all have a social construct? Is it a product of external influences? My point in bringing up these questions is to provide a theoretical framework that can orient our discussion around what we can and ought to do practically in our own lives to improve the human condition. Understanding how power structures work to define and administer justice is key to understanding our rights and responsibilities as citizens of the world. The Malian Dialogue is a good springboard for the discussion on the role of the powerful in shaping the definition of justice in a society. This dialogue comes from Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War, which puts forward the theory of political realism that we still use in our analysis of world relations today. Thucydides writes, and I quote, most people seem to think sheer domination is what is appropriate in the political sphere. 
and they are not ashamed to practice in regard to outsiders what they recognize as neither just nor expedient in their dealing with each other as individuals. For their own affairs, amongst themselves that is, they demand an authority based on justice. But in regard to outsiders, justice is no concern of theirs. End of quote. Think about that quote and how it can be applied to the current political climate in our part of the world. For to me, what I have just read to you in, in, out of that quote, foreshadows the very famous double standard argument, which started to ferment in our region as well as elsewhere in the global south in the 60s and 70s of the last century, when the former colonial powers supported regimes that in the eyes of their, their own people were unjust. Never mind that our value system stands in direct opposition to the basic tenets of democracy that you claim to uphold. Never mind, never mind, never mind. So long as we protect your global, I mean, geopolitical interests, again, those regimes implicitly arguing, so long as we protect your geopolitical interests, why should it be any of your business how we choose to treat our own citizens? And the West, that is, the United States and Western Europe, not only acquiesced to this perverse rationale, they were perceived by people in the region to be active participants in the creation of a suppressive political environment that pervaded every aspect of people's lives in the, in the region. The ferment of resentment took hold and ultimately led to the emergence of an ideology that I myself termed or described as rejectionism. Youth in Egypt, Tunisia, and Libya can navigate the world through social media and connect with their peers in the Netherlands, in France, and the United States and realize that they too want to make a decent living. That they too are capable of doing wonderful things with their lives if only they too had the freedom and opportunity to do so together with aforementioned resentment, rejectionism, and frustration with the status quo, this growing knowledge of what it meant to be a citizen with unabridged rights elsewhere in the world, the stage was set for what followed. The stage was set for the spark that was provided by the self-emulation of Bazizi in Tunisia, which in turn marked the outbreak of the Arab Spring. Ladies and gentlemen, Martin Luther King once said, <clears throat> oppressed people cannot remain oppressed forever. The yearning for freedom eventually manifests itself, and that is what has happened to the American Negro. But as we have seen in the case of Egypt, for example, and a lot more tragically in Syria, when justice is absent for too long in a society, a revolution, at least in the short term, will likely result in destroying things, is more likely to result in destroying things than building them. This has led many to mistakenly conclude that people in our part of the world must make a choice between democracy on the one hand and stability on the other. This, I believe, is a dangerously short-sighted view of the world and history. We are no different than citizens elsewhere in the world. We need not be or be seen as having to make a choice. This is a fallacy between stability on the one hand and democracy on the other. In any case, we can point to many examples throughout history that shed light on our region's current predicament. In this context, let me point out, to place these matters in perspective, that the 1979 Iranian Revolution led to a repressive Islamic Republic of Iran with a full democracy. To go back further, the French Revolution of 1789 did not create a viable democracy until three revolutions and almost one century later. 
the American Revolution of 1776 did not automatically produce justice. It was followed by the Civil War. It was followed by an end to slavery, women's suffrage, and desegregation, which were all wrought by struggle and sacrifice. The great 20th century revolutions also exa exemplify this pattern. The, 19, the 1917 Russian Revolution created a totalitarian Soviet Union that lasted until after the Cold War in 1991. The 1911 Chinese Revolution led to the 1949 Chinese Revolution, and more than six decades later, China has made limited progress towards democracy. So our region, with particular reference to Egypt, for example, with its failure to rise from the ashes of the revolution of 2011 is not just a reminder of the tumultuous journey towards justice, but also was ju why justice was necessary in the first instance. What all of this teaches us is that whether a people's struggle is motivated by a desire for an ideal, justice, or a hunger for power, the absence of justice, or just, or even just the general perception of injustice uh, is simply, is simply uh, unsustainable. At a time when so many basic democratic tenets of our part of the world seem to be in constant turmoil, those who had the reins of power in the international order, world order must uphold the universality of human rights and the indivisibility of justice. It is time to reevaluate their role in guaranteeing justice for all people of all countries consistently and non selectively. Chomsky makes this point in the aforementioned debate with Foucault. He says, and I quote, in those areas where the legal system happens to represent not better justice, but rather the techniques of oppression that have been codified in a particular autocratic system, he argues under those conditions, a reasonable human being should disregard and oppose them, end of quote. That's precisely what Nelson Mandela did to fight apartheid in South Africa. And it's the same reasoning that guided the civil rights movement in the United States. I did quote Martin Luther King earlier. King made reference to St. Aquinas's distinction between just and unjust laws. In determining the difference between the two, he said, and I quote, any law that uplifts the human personality is just. On the other hand, any law that degrades human personality is unjust. Well, how can an individual obey a law that reinforces his or her status as an inferior member of society? Essentially, that, that, that's what this is about. How can we, Palestinians, accept a life under occupation when we know that we are meant to be free. When we launched that program, which uh, movie 194 was about, State 194 was about, four years ago, many dismissed it as an exercise in idealism. And maybe those people were right in thinking that our state building initiative wouldn't end the occupation. Clearly, it has not. But despite all of that, I stand here today feeling more hopeful than ever. And the reason I say that is because it allowed me to see firsthand the extraordinary power of the human spirit to achieve great many things under the most unambiguously adverse circumstances. It got our people to think, if we could achieve all of this, build hundreds of new schools and clinics and pave new roads and develop new housing projects and adequate governance structures under a crippling occupation, just imagine what we can achieve for ourselves once we are allowed to realize our full potential. The idea, which to me was a fully integrated political vision and continues to be, it was to impart a sense of possibility to people about what we want to see happen. In his conclusion of the myth of Sisyphus, Albert Camus writes, and I quote, one must imagine Sisyphus happy, unquote. By choosing to live in spite of his eternal punishment, Sisyphus resists the entrapment of victimhood. That's why he saw Sisyphus as happy. 
notwithstanding his, his predicament. That, to me, is very powerful. And that's what we sought to achieve, we Palestinians sought to achieve, through the act of building our state. We are, through that act of building, we were and we continue to be, essentially telling the world that we have agency in our liberation. It's up to us somehow. That's emancipating. That's very powerful. And it definitely does lift the spirit. The famous American historian Howard Zinn once wrote, if we do act in however a small way, we don't have to wait for some grand utopian future. The future, he says, is an infinite succession of presents. And to live now as we think human beings should live, in defiance of all that is bad around us, is itself a marvelous victory. In his letter from the Birmingham jail, Martin Luther King reminds his oppressors that, and I quote, true peace is not merely the absence of tension, it is the presence of justice. End of quote. The presence of justice, in our case, requires that the fundamental asymmetry between, in, 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 the, in the balance of power between the occupier and the occupied be redressed. So why is all this relevant to our discussion of power and justice? Because it suggests to us that our notion of justice is innate. It is an inherent part of our being. We may not need to be reminded, or actually, in the words of Martin Luther King, we may need to be reminded that it can be gained, but we know what it looks like even if we've been denied its virtues. These historical examples also reveal that justice is not only necessary to maintain proper balance in society, but that there is an extraordinary power that lies in the promise of justice. Indeed, it is that promise of justice that has written the story of human progress, in my view, striving to achieve it. It is a promise of justice that empowers the oppressed to resist senseless violence with stubborn nonviolence, to listen to their hopes instead of their fears, to let go of their doubts and take hold of their dreams. That is the power of justice to me. It is precisely because superiors have the power to cultivate a definition of justice that power needs to be checked, because the weak may acquiesce at first, but they won't acquiesce forever. Our responsibility, therefore, as citizens of the world, is to strive to ensure that more and more people derive power from the promise of peaceful transformation and justice. But that requires us to summon the knowledge of what binds us together in spite of our differences. I've always wondered what our world would look like if it were just as easy for a rich man to imagine what it is like to be poor. as, it, as it, it is for a poor man to imagine what it is like to be rich. Of course, I don't mean rich in the literal sense. I mean it in the more figurative sense, uh, connoting power and privilege. Maybe that's the root cause of, of injustice in our world, what I call the empathy gap. The empathy gap, a subconscious unwillingness among those in power to place themselves in the shoes of the disadvantaged. It may be precisely that lack of understanding of what it means to struggle that leads the privileged few to turn a blind eye and abandon their responsibility to others. I believe that to whom much is given, much is to be expected. We all possess that innate human connection, but we must, stop, but we must tap into it. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to end on this note. I'd like to assure you that we Palestinians want a lasting peace with Israel and our Israeli neighbors. But we can only get to that point if a sense of real mutual respect begins to develop. Our late poet, Mahmoud Darwish, once wrote, and I quote, peace cannot obtain 
but between equals. I know that they will come. I know that they will come because I do know in my heart that indeed we are equal. The thought of that day, the promise of it, the promise of the power of justice inspires me as I hope it does everyone in this hall and beyond. Yes, that power, the power of the promise of justice. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you.